Thank you for tuning in. This is Lewis Lee with First African Baptist Church located in Goldsboro, North Carolina, where our theme is encouraging hearts, changing lives, and saving souls. God is truly in the blessing business, and we thank him for his grace and his mercy. We thank him that his precious spirit dwells within us and gives us the strength to press on. Keep praying, keep trusting in Jesus, keep believing that God is a way maker. Uh, today, we certainly have heavy hearts. We want to pray for all of our soldiers. We know on the news where several of our soldiers from Fort Bragg, right down the street from our church, were deployed back to Afghanistan. And anytime we hear about soldiers placing their lives in harm's way, whether they're going to rescue our, our existing soldiers to help them make life better for, for, for the women and daughters in Afghanistan, or whatever they're doing and moving, we certainly pray that God's protection will be over our soldiers and that God will bless their families also. That's very important. That's a critical part of the body of Christ that we need to pray for one another. And we also need to thank God for those that sacrifice and place themselves in harm's way. So we certainly are joining in prayer with all of our families, with, with soldiers that are out. School is about to start, and when some daddies are at home helping check homework and helping to get lunchbox packed, we have our daddies out fighting on battlefields, so we certainly want to keep those families in prayer. Today we're moving along. There is a word that's found in Acts, the fourth chapter, and we're going to pick up from where we left off last week. Acts, the fourth chapter, and I'm going to read from verses 32 through 37. So let, let us share together. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, and neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. My, my, my. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and the great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses and sold them and brought the prices of the things which were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And, and Joseph, who by the apostle was surnamed Barnabas, which was being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. My, 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 my. Look at how God is moving and how the one thing that we have identified in Scripture that we see very prevalent in the world, for the love of money is the root of all evil, and we see the absolute reverse of this moving in this text because there's a, a, a hidden ingredient that was blessing. And that ingredient was found in the 33rd verse. And it says, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. When grace takes over. Dear Lord, we thank you today. We praise you and we magnify your holy name. Move and have your way in the scripture, Father. We pray that you would use it to encourage a heart, change a life, and save a soul. In the wonderful name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. When grace takes over, always something's competing to take over. I remember when I was a teenager, one of the popular soul songs on the radio was by a young singer named Shante Moore, and she wrote this song. Now that love is taking over. Every young man was out there was hoping in his mind that love would take over. There are people that find themselves moving and, and get caught up in the cares of this world and alcohol can take over, drugs can take over. There's always something in life that can take over. But grace represents something different but today we hope to unwrap the beauty of grace and look at grace from a, a different but, but more of a molecular angle so that we can dive into grace and kind of see just what God is doing for us and through us by the power of his grace. So grace, first of all, the definition of grace is God's unmerited favor. And we're dealing with the early book of Acts and the early account of the church 
where all of these apostles, all of these men, all of these women and children that were there gathered together and they that were products of that upper room pouring out of God's Holy Spirit. And everyone that was added to the body of Christ since that day all came under the grace of the Lord. Because grace, the definition of grace is God's unmerited favor. How many of us deserve to be forgiven? What can we do to deserve to be called? And not only called, but adopted and purchased and, and brought in as a body and a family of the family of God. What could you give in exchange that your body could be healed and another man's body could be healed? And how could you do? Is there any special formula that you can do? You know, money can buy you a bigger place in line. You need a liver transplant. Money may buy you a bigger place in line where you can jump over the line or jump over the line for a heart or jump over the line for a kidney or jump over the line for a pancreas or whatever it is you need transplanted in your body. But money cannot make that organ compatible with your body. Money cannot make your body respond in a proper, in a functioning way. Money cannot give you the strength and the sustenance to keep moving where your body can fight off future infections. Money may be able to give you the best houses and land and it may be able to hire the best security, but money cannot give you a safety of mind where you can be free of mind and free of heart. Money can put together and it can buy you a trophy wife or sugar daddy husband or whatever you're looking for in life, but money can't bring companionship. Money cannot bring a growing together, the things that come from the heart extending one to another. So if you are receiving any of these things I've just talked about, if you've had healing in your body, if you have people that love you, if you have individuals that help warm your heart and make you a part of their family, and most of all, if you are part of the family of Jesus Christ, then money could not buy that. That was all a gift that none of us deserved. So when we think about grace and it was God's unmerited favor is actually more than what we deserve. And God never pay us back what we deserve. See, God is a seed sowing God. And one of the beautiful things about seed sowing, all of the former farmers of the world understand the power of seed sowing. When you sow seeds, you always reap more than what you sow. One kernel of corn in a hole. You water that corn, you nurture that corn. That corn stalk brings out several ears of corn with several seedlings that can be reprocessed to grow more corn. But it started with one kernel of corn. And that's how God operates in our lives. God gives us a dose of his love, a dose of his forgiveness, a dose of his mercy. And he takes something that was corrupt and messed up and on the wrong track. And that one moment of experiencing God and experiencing his love and knowing that he loves us and he cares for us and, and he's, uh, he's in charge of everything, it transformed our entire life where now we function in a different manner because we see grace moving. It was unmerited favor. Why do we bless everything we eat? It's not that, that we are sitting there taking for granted and it become an ordinary routine prayer. Lord, thank you for this food. Lord, bless this food. God is grace and God is good. And we do all of our standard routines, but the practice of grace and teaching your family to respect God and to bless everything that enter your mouth, you're simply saying, God, for me to be able to consume this sausage biscuit, that means that you bless some farmer somewhere. That means that some animal was blessed somewhere. That means that some market was blessed somewhere. That means that some processing facility was sterilized and it was blessed by the hand of God somewhere. That means that some stove, some restaurant, some kitchen, somewhere was functioning right. Somebody showed up to work to do their job, Father, from the supermarket to the restaurant or to the kitchen to the table, and they blessed me. Somebody in my home loved me enough to prepare something 
perfect so I can have strength to move on, God. Then you're going to move in my body. And if any atmospheric things have jumped on this, God, you have blessed it and you've made something happening. You're going to allow my body to receive what I'm placing on the inside. And it's going to be fruitful for my body. And then you're going to convert that power over the energy where I can do the things that you would have me to do. I'm telling you, there's something powerful when we just stop and bless that food when we think about all of the ingredients that went inside to make that happen. That's just an illustration of God's grace. We got one blessing before we bite down on that biscuit. God had a whole chain of seasons and events that he has blessed all of the different elements to bring that biscuit into your home. God's grace is amazing. And so we think about what God was doing for the church. They already realized that they had more than what they would deserve. A group of afraid individuals, a group of timid individuals, a group of collection that the world had deemed a bunch of somebodies and maybe bodies and nobodies. And they all got together. And no matter what the academic pedigree was, no matter what the economic status that you brought to the table, no matter what was dealing in life, no matter who had this car or that car, there were mansion owners, there were homeless individuals, there were educators, there were the uneducated, there were medical doctors, there were the sick that needed some help. There were all types of people and the Bible said they had one thing that made the difference. The grace of the Lord had all things in common. Can you imagine a world where no matter what you bring to the table everybody is blessed. Can you imagine a world where no matter what you bring to the table everybody is somebody. Can you imagine a world that no matter where life is taking you and no matter how scorned you are, no matter how scarred you are from the cares of this world, everybody is somebody. Can you imagine a world where no matter where you've been and no matter how wrong you've been, you got a God that when you read the word, you fall down and you open up your heart and say, God, I'm sorry and I want to start all over again and everything gets reversed. Can you imagine a world where all that exists, where God was simply saying, you shouldn't have to imagine a world where that exists. You should not have to be looking out on a hill trying to think of some theological utopia. You should not be trying to form some new wave of government or depending upon a government. But that power and that love and that unity and that cohesiveness ought to be found in the local church because just like the early church, they had everything in common. Everybody was blessed. Everybody was trying to help somebody. It was not about begging and waiting and somebody having to beg this and state their case this. The Bible says they had all things in common. Isn't that amazing? It's because the grace of the Lord was unmerited favor. So the first thing was, there's nothing you can do to earn grace. God didn't bless you because you're so good. Well, my surgery went well because I did everything they told me to do. And I ate right and I exercised right and I did this and I did that and I did this and I did that. And as if you didn't reach some type of standard where you can move. When you were younger, you drank as much liquor as you could get your hands on. Probably smoked as much weed as anybody else and inhaled when you had it. Chased more women or men or whatever you were chasing and did everything that everybody else did. But when God looked at your life, God said, I see something that I created and you were not raised to be like this. And he poured his grace and his mercy over your life and it wiped everything out of your life and he gave you a brand new life so it was not what you did but it was what God did through his grace how do you describe a man that say I'm in perfect health that drink every Budweiser he can get his hands on when he was a young man I had a liver problem and I've never taken a drop of alcohol in my life I apologize, I went and did communion with my Catholic brothers at a funeral about four years ago and I did have something at the communion thing and I hated every bit of it and I won't ever go do it again. I like grape juice with my community, but I apologize. But before that event, there was never 
ever that was never a taste of anything, didn't know what it tastes like, doesn't know what it feels like, but yet I found myself needing liver help when I went to the doctor because I had a bad situation in my liver and God gave me a brand new one, no surgery, no nothing, it was just prayer and fasting and the doctor said it looked like you got a brand new baby liver, nothing but the hand of God. But how do you explain one man that has never had a sip needing a liver and another man that has drank all his life and he doesn't need anything so it was not about what you've done or I've done or we've done or could have done or should have done it was just God is a graceful God and he gives unmerited faith and not only did they have that grace but this text goes around and it talks about the power that they had and the ability to share and how every man had in common and how there was a respect amongst them and so it brought us to the second thing we think about grace let's look at what grace will do Grace has that amazing strength that grace can bring us together. Grace has that amazing unity factor where it can bring the best out of us. Grace can take two roommates and say, listen, you don't deserve to be here and you don't deserve to be here. But by the grace of the Lord, we are together and we're at this university and we're going to make it work. So everything you bring to the table and everything I bring to the table, we're going to make it work and we're going to grow up and be great young women or great young men moving by the body of Christ. Grace can take brothers on the digging body and can say, listen, you came from this background. Your daddy was a digging. Your granddaddy was a digging. You brought this to the table. And another brother who said, I didn't know anything about church till your daddy put his arms around me and they loved me at that church. And you can come together and you can grow in grace and both of you can grow to be men of God. Grace is that power where two sisters can show up from the other side of the track. One is experienced and season. One has all the decorum that you would expect from a church mother and the other one is wild and ruthless but God can bring you together and blend you together and the next thing you know you can be a mighty movement for the power of God. That's what grace will do. And so we saw it in the early church where they had everybody had everything they needed and no one lacked because it was by the power of grace. Now, am I asking you to go sell everything you got and bring it in here <clears throat> and let's get together and put a big pile of money? No, that's not what God is advocating for in this text. The early church was the missionary church that was on the move. They were not stationary. To belong to the body of Christ during this time meant that your life was on the run because all of the rulers and the governments where it had, had murder sentences on the early part of the church because they were trying to quiet and shut down what they thought was a temporary phenomenon, the name of Jesus Christ. So when they sold their possessions and they gathered together, they were functioning as a community because they had to be on the run to make sure that the church and the will of Christ could move as God has established. We're not on the run with our possessions and our cars and our houses and land. Matter of fact, God bless us so much. Many times we run it from God, not running for God. But what God was saying in this text was that we still have a responsibility to reserve that community feeling where you don't have to go sell everything that you have in your house and bring it out here so that someone can eat. Our church has got money in the bank. God then blessed us with buildings we didn't pay for. God gives the church everything she needs. So this is simply telling the church that we cannot be the stingiest act in town. That's not willing and that's not cohesive to the will of God. Church should not be so concerned about storing up money so that we can build more windows and buildings and all these things. But we ought to be concerned about needs and people and blessing. Church ought to not be the worst employer, the worst friend, the worst relief agency, but we ought to be those that have a heart that everything that I want for myself, I want to see it in everybody else's life and I want people to be blessed and to move. Don't make folk have to beg, borrow, and deal. Don't sit on a bunch of money when you got college students that need help in the financial aid office, homeless folk that need a meal every 
every now and then you got extra clothes in your closet and there's someone lacking without that's out there. So what this is saying is that we got to have a heart where we don't look at what other folks are doing and what this person is doing and we ought to do this and you ought to do this and they ought to do this. This right here, we're simply saying every part of the body of Christ, if I've been covered by God's grace, this is my responsibility. So grace is what God does for us. Grace is what God does to us. Because not only does grace forgive us, but grace also gives us the motion that we could function in ways that we never thought we could function. Somebody who's a brother, always angry, God can give you a kindness of heart that'll make a difference in your life. But the third thing is not what grace did for us. Not, 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 not what grace is doing to us. But then there's a responsibility of what grace does through us. See, Barnabas was not an ordinary person. Barnabas was part of that missionary journey that worked together with Paul to get Paul started on the road to Christ. Barnabas was the apostle that came in there. And so Barnabas, being the leader, he stepped out. And so that, that, that's another thing about it. You know, if you're going to be serving, everybody want to have position. Everybody want to be a preacher, an apostle, and a bishop, and a and an arch, whatever folks, people calling themselves everything. Everybody want a title in life, but to be in God's service means that you got to be a giver at heart because God is not just giving you stuff so you can park your Maserati in front of the church and look like the best and brag about your $3,000 suits. No, God gives what we give so we can take care of our family and bless our family and keep our family comfortable. But God also requires that you have a giving heart and that giving heart requires what you do with your hands and what you do with your life and what you do with the things you do to serve God. I got some rules. Since I'm a preacher, I'm going to talk about preacher rules. I can't stand a stingy preacher. Never give anybody anything. No, that's not my avenue. I wasn't raised that way. I wasn't raised, I was raised by a giving preacher. I've lived my life to be a giving preacher and I've taught my kids to be givers. So not only do we give in our tithes and offering, but we try to help people as the Lord bless. So I don't like a stingy preacher and a lazy preacher. See, I can't stand no lazy preacher. With, never able to deal with it, never able to move. But the other thing is one that lacks foresight. Don't, don't always be able to explain everything you do. I get so tired of people saying, you got to slow down and you got to do this and you got to, listen, I heard a long time ago, I would rather burn out than rust out. Because if I burn out, I'm burning out for the Lord. And I know that when this earthly body is dissolved, I got a new home in glory. Now that's not an excuse to make unwise decisions and not get proper rest. But it's also saying that you got to be on the move for the Lord and looking for ways to make a difference. And you got to always be moving. Don't get caught up in what the world wants you to be, but be who God desired for you to be. That was an old digger, Digger Swenson. When I went over and took him out to eat one day and Digger Swenson and I were talking and he said, Reverend, I've been all my life, I'm used to preaching just wearing suits and sitting around and doing a lot of talking like we do now. He said, but I noticed that that's not your style. He said, young man, you'd rather be cutting somebody's grass than you would be sitting in a restaurant. And I sure want to thank you. He said, I hope I've helped you, but you've helped me. But Diggins went and said, let me tell you something, son. Every time you go to the store, make sure you buy the shoe that fit. And I thought about that thing when I was, I was young at the time. I was only 31 years old. I said, he didn't told me that buy the shoe that fit. I've been wearing a size 12 shoe since I was in the 11th grade. And he told me to buy the shoe that fit. And it was later when I visited him towards the end of his life that he said, you remember I told you to buy the shoe that fit? He said, people always go in the store and they buy the shoe that's on sale. They buy the name brand, the one that got the soul that they like, or one that looks good with their outfit. He said, but Reverend, when you put that shoe on, if that shoe don't fit right, it's not going to do you any good. And he said, you understand what I'm talking about? 
And I understood it just as crystal clear. When you buy the shoe that fit, you got to make sure it fit who you are. It fits your body type. It fits your weight. It fits what makes you feel like somebody. It's a shoe that you can keep on every day. And so that's what grace does for us. Grace brings out the best in us. So everywhere we go, we can give of ourselves. And we got something that fit us. Grace can take a former drunk and make him an alcohol counselor. Grace can take a former a prostitute and make her a clean up person for those women in need. Grace can take a former card shark or Grace can take a former numbers runner and make them a trustee at the church. Grace can take a former drug addict and make them somebody that's hyped up for the Lord. That's the power of what grace can do through us because God gives us the shoe that fit. He knew you before you knew yourself. He knew me before I knew myself. He knew us before we knew ourselves. So God gives each and every one of us something special from the birth of our lives to the day he called us home and there's a common place in the common body where what we have can fit in the body of Christ and if we just open up our eyes and open up our ears and open up our hearts and hands God can use us to do his will to his glory that's the power of what grace can do through us but in my closing when they laid it at the apostles' feet, they willfully did whatever was needed to make a difference for the body of Christ. Nobody was comparing who visited the most folks this week. Well, pastor, I went over here and I went over there and I did this and I did that. That's your ministry, that's your call, that's your energy, that's your shoe that fit. The next person said, well, I don't move around that way. But I sure enough lifted up everybody in prayer. I could get to come across my, my heart. That's a wonderful thing. That's your shoe. That's your ministry. That's your shoe that fit. Another was saying, I, 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 don't, I don't really do too well talking to folks. I don't really like to speak to people in public. And I, I'm not a good orator. And I don't have a lot of this. But God didn't bless me to retire. And I got everything in good shape. And I got resources that I want to share to bless somebody. That's your ministry. That's your shoe that fits. And then another would say, listen, I, I don't have money, houses, and land. And I don't have that. But I've raised up my children and my children children are good and I'm going to put my children to work in the church and they're going to help fortify the choir. They're going to be ushering on the usher door. They're going to be helping out with the Sunday school. If there's a senior in need, my son is a strong, strappy boy. If there's somebody that needs a baby sitting in the nursery, my young girl can help out and she's a very caring young lady. That's your shoe. That's your ministry. That's your size that fit. Grace is about God giving us what we don't deserve. It's about God doing more inside of us than we ever thought that could happen. But then it's about God taking those things and he gets something that custom fits us so that no matter how low we thought we were, God can take whatever we got and he can reinvest it in the body and he can make it so that we can help grow the body of Christ. That's the power of what happens when grace takes over. Grace doesn't behave unseemly. Grace doesn't behave uncharacteristically. But grace takes over. It makes a difference in your life. It'll make a difference in mine. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Louis Lee with the First African Baptist Church. But the good news is if you've never asked grace to enter your life, why not today open up your hearts and let the love of Christ come in. He'll bless you. He'll make a difference. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Thank you today, God, for giving me forgiveness that I did not deserve. Thank you, Lord, for blessing me, keeping me, and thank you, God, that although the world may think I'm a nobody, I serve a Savior who knows that I'm somebody. Thank you for saving my soul. If you've asked Christ to come into your heart, believe and rest assured that his grace will do that indeed. Thank you so much for tuning in. May God bless you. May heaven smile upon you.